this discussion with uh, Professor Saul Newman from Goldsmiths London. Professor Newman is uh, an expert in post-anarchism, political theology, and an array radical politics, and an array of other uh, thematic areas. And we're overjoyed to have him here. Thank you, Thank you very much for your presence uh, and this opportunity, Professor Newman. Allow me to begin our discussion by asking you about the form that radical politics might take in the current circumstances, the predicament of the COVID crisis, with everything that this entails and everything that this changes. How, you, how do you see things in this uh, predicament? Well, it seems to me the situation is very, at the moment, very unclear and very fluid um, because, you know, society is still in, in a state of shock and rupture as a result of the uh, you know the effects of the pandemic and also particularly the uh, the government's uh, measures which have been employed to contain the uh, spread of the pandemic and what we've seen i think is an unprecedented uh, accumulation of state power i mean yes. the the astonishing power of the state to impose a lockdown on, on their entire population on millions of people to imprison them inside their own homes and to impose these extraordinary restrictions on normal everyday social interactions um, and I, I think, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to gauge what the long-term political consequences of, of these kinds of measures will be, whether they'll become a permanent feature of contemporary democracies, whether democracies will blur into some kind of uh, authoritarian, uh, uh, you know, uh, systems, for instance, whether, um, you know, whether, whether that kind of distinction between democracy and, uh, and, and authoritarianism will become permanently indistinct, permanently blurred. But one of the hopeful signs, of course, is that you know radical political movements have are, are still still very much present, and I think in some ways have actually uh, become more active. Um, so we've seen, for instance, the protests around the world against police violence in the United States and against systemic racism. We've seen Black Lives Matter. We've seen the revolution in, in Belarus. Um, so I think one of the hopeful signs is that you know despite all of these repressive measures which have been employed by the state. That uh, that you know that people are still prepared to mobilise, to go out into the streets, to protest, to riot in some cases. So so people have not been deterred by you know either by by, by the threat of the virus or, or the um, or the, the sort of the, the measures of control which have been uh, employed by the state. And I think it's a very hopeful sign. But in terms of the long term consequences, it's, it's very unclear. Um, it's, I, I, I think only time will tell. One of my hopes is that we will move into a, a, a different kind of economy, a different uh, society, which might, uh, um, you know, be more sort of ecologically sustainable, for instance. But my fear, of course, is that things will kind of go back to normal, only worse, in in terms of you know how the economy is structured and uh, and so on. In view of the very power that the state has amassed mm. during those times, mm. the question is: Is there an element in political mobiliza mobilization? that requires physical presence, I mean social distancing, mm -hmm. uh, lockdowns, curfews and all that, obviously uh, disallow, uh, make, the, 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 make the option of a crowd on the streets protesting, for example, yes. impossible. Uh, is a digitization of political mobilization possible or desirable? Is it something that in this direction poses a problem for political uh, mobilization and radical politics. But you see, the interesting thing is that people are still gathering physically. Um, and in some ways, I mean, they're wearing masks and they're, they're taking the, the basic precautions, but um, people are still prepared to, 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 to gather en masse. And I think that's very important, actually, for radical politics. I, mean, I, I don't think that some kind of digital mobilization c can replace bodies in the street or bodies in, 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 in you know, public places. Um, uh, you know, uh, I mean, one of the problems, as I said, is the the increasing virtualization of our lives in the digital space, and this is something which has been accelerated, of course, in in the current crisis, where everyone is working from home and having Zoom conferences and Zoom meetings and so on. Um, and uh, there's something very alienating about this, it seems to me, and very politically disabling. Um, I don't think you will ever replace the um, the you know the the kind of the the, the sort of the the, the, the the interactions which will um, which can only really take place in, in a kind of physical proximity. Uh, yes, no, no. I mean, I, I, yeah. So I mean, I, I know there's been a lot of talk about how the digital revolution has kind of created new 
ways of new forms of political communication. But it seems to me that you still need bodies in the street. You still there's still a, a room or a very important uh, uh, space for you know for protests and for mass mobilizations. Um, and you know if you look at you know, sort of you know recent or relatively recent you know like Occupy Wall Street for instance. I mean the, the whole idea of people gathering on mass and, and holding open air meetings and uh, you know communicating in close physical proximity it was actually very very central to those kinds of movements. You, you won't replace that um, simply through virtual communication, and nor should you. From your point of view, um, what is this vital element in the physical presence? Because the counter argument would be, no, that's a technophobic um, that is technophobic critique. Mm. Uh, technology will g grant us with uh, immense possibilities that were not the case previously, etc. Mm. So, being critical towards this development or towards parts of these developments would be problematic. But what would be that element which is irreplaceable in the physical space? Well, I mean, there's, there's two parts to this. I mean, I think, I think, I think, virtual, I think technology is, is a double-edged sword in a way. I mean, yes, it, it facilitates uh, political communication, but at the same time, it, it's a kind of a trap, isn't it? I mean, uh, the way in which you know, we, we, uh, we're increasingly reliant upon social media, for instance, to, to communicate with others. I mean, um, the, I mean, for instance, the way in which uh, our data is, uh, is harvested and uh, the way in which it becomes a tool of surveillance. Um, so it seems to me that um, we need to find ways of escaping this kind of digital panopticon, if you like, through, um, you know, once again, through, through kind of through physical mobilizations. Um, to me, there is something quite vital and something quite important about, um, about sort of physical proximity. And one of the things I'm actually very worried about, of course, is the way in which this emphasis on sort of social distancing um, will, will create a permanent scar in social relations. I mean, even, even after the pandemic crisis is over, even after a vaccine is found, I think, I think one of my fears is that people will, will no longer be able to, <laughs> will, will, you know, will be, will be so fearful of any kind of, you know, physical proximity. That well, they, not in Greece. <laughs> well, let's hope not. Let's hope not. Yes. Um, Sorry. So, yeah, I, I mean, it seems to me that um, that's still a very important part of, um, of kind of political engagement, actually. The, the, the perhaps, perhaps there's something to do with the, the, the taking a kind of a risk physically, um, putting, putting one's body on the line. I mean, ha encountering the possibility, at least, of, of, of police violence. I mean, that there's something symbolically important, it seems to me, about people mobilizing physically. Firstly, as a way of escaping this kind of digital trap, um, but but secondly, as a kind of a, a symbol of a, of a kind of a mass movement, a mass bodies, and this perhaps goes back to perhaps it's a very traditional idea, perhaps of um, of, of political mobilisation. But it seems to me that there is something vital about um, people communicating in kind of close physical proximity. And as you said, uh, non-physical proximity mm. uh, mediated by yes. um, the b b by the digital world also means mediated in general, mm. either by private companies yes, yes. or even by a state that would be not ideal. And mm. <laughs> an ideal state is a contradiction in terms. Mm. Obviously, it's a contradiction in terms. Yeah. So, uh, okay, let us think for a moment that one could evade that by physical, uh, by being present physically. Uh, to not have one's political communication, for example, and mobilization mm. mediated either by companies or by the state one tries to counter right. with that mobilization. However, the thing is that currently, due to its very digital metamorphosis, the world is connected in mm. ways that transcend physical distance sure. radically. Yes, yes. So a mobil mobilization that would try to evade the mediation of the internet, etc., would be limited to physical distances, to spaces yes. that are uh, more and more irrelevant, the, the small scale. Yes. Or well, could well, that be turned into a, uh, an asset, the very fact that the small scale is the locus of the no, political I mean, mobilization. I, I mean, I, I think you need both. Yes. That, that, that'd be my point. I mean, you know, I, I'm not suggesting that, um, you know, internet-based communication technologies are not a very important tool of organization and mobilization. 
but I, I think that it needs to um, be accompanied, it seems to me, by, by, by mass mobilizations in the street. So I think you need both. I mean, um, and this, this is a way, I think, to create a, a movement or a series of movements which are both, both localized but also, also transnational and transcend national borders and boundaries and so on. Um, Can we conceive of a digital network that would be mediated neither by the state nor by private companies? How would that look like? An alternative Facebook, perhaps, that kind of thing. Yes. By, by whom? <laughs> yes, the well, no, yes, in, yes. well, that's right. I mean, but the, I think there have been some experiments with alternative models of um, uh, sort of social networks, but um, yeah, I... I uh, still uh, owned by somebody. That's still, a, well, that's right, yeah, yeah. But I mean, you know, the, I mean, this was part of the, the kind of the, the, the utopianism of the, the early theorists of the internet, wasn't it? That yeah. It was going to create a kind of a horizontal space but of course what we found is a uh, is a massive kind of hierarchization of power of course you know um you know with with the big uh, silicon valley uh, companies who control data and um you know which are you know which which are really the kind of the power brokers behind the scenes if you like um this is where power in our contemporary societies lies it's not with uh, politicians and elected officials it, it's with uh, with big data companies who you know who um you know, who, who, uh, who, who increasingly control our, our lives and our interactions and uh, track our movements and our preferences. And, uh, um, and this, this is the problem. I mean, that, you know, that, you know, power has become much more centralized, I think, in the, in the internet space and digital space. Well, these are preoccupations that uh, guide us in the center for post-capitalist civilization in the sense that the current predicament cannot anymore be properly described as capitalism, either mm. due to the disjunction yes. from the, of the finan financialization yes. with reality, from reality, but also due to the very weird directions that power online mm. uh, is acquiring and uh, the, the impulse to think of, uh, of alternatives mm. to this, etc. But a wider question now, how do you see this whole transitional uh, period mm. uh, that we are in uh, right now? Yeah, so I, I think you're right. I mean, I think um, we can no longer really talk about neoliberal capitalism in the same way, perhaps, as we were doing before. And I think it's, it's an increasingly contested uh, discourse, isn't it? I mean, so for instance, we, we have governments around the world spending billions and, and trillions of dollars on propping up the economy. I mean, I mean, you know, they've gone back to some kind of traditional Keynesianism where they're just throwing vast sums of money at, you know, uh, paying people salaries, for instance. And, um, you know, I mean, I, I heard recently that the, the deficit in the, in the United Kingdom, where I'm from, is now two trillion pounds, um, which, is, which is the, it's the biggest budget deficit in, 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 in UK history. Um, so, and, and this obviously goes against the traditional model of Sort of neoliberal economics in a big way. Also, of course, we have the ecological question: whether and, and I think in a way the, the the virus is kind of a symbol of the looming ecological crisis and the need for um, for the economy to sort of transform into a more ecologically sustainable model. Whether whether it can or whether there's enough political will behind that is uh, is perhaps a different question. Uh, Yes, I mean, I think you're right. I think the current crisis could possibly generate alternative forms of, of economy, which are which are more sort of sort of horizontal and and, and decentralized, and and, and post-capitalist, and perhaps more reliant upon uh, you know mutual aid and assistance and networks of solidarity, for instance. Um, uh, but but the I think that would mostly involve, for instance, more localized experiments and community networks and kinds of you know grassroots um, uh, sort of networks of solidarity which which might form in, in the uh, and, and which indeed are, are already emerging I think in the context of the crisis actually um, so so yes it's a, it's it's a possibility it's a possibility and a very interesting possibility it seems to me concerning your comment on uh, the uh, COVID crisis as a prelude to the ecological catastrophe mm. The surprising, the end, uh, uh, the, uh, the surprising and foul development is that instead of us diagnosing this mm. in such a way with all the alternative politics that this would dictate, we seem to be taking the other route. 
we seem to be saying no still with our vaccines etc mm. we will exert our power yes, over yes. nature will overpower yes. the problem yes. and continue with our course yes. rather than changing it as a political theorist mm. what do you think is it that makes uh, human nature so stubborn politically well, I, I think that also relates to, the, to, to political theology as well as political theory. I mean, it's, it's, it's anthropocentrism, isn't it? It's, it's this idea which, which we've inherited from religion and from many theological traditions, you know, which is to say that man is master of the earth and dominates all of the living creatures and dominates the natural environment and, and the earth is just simply here for our, our, our enjoyment, our exploitation. Um, and it's something to do with, 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 with hubris. You know, human hubris. This uh, this kind of idea that um, we can resolve all these problems through technology or through, you know, human ingenuity. And it's it's an, it's it's an illusion. I mean, we've reached a kind of a tipping point, um, ecologically speaking, that the age of the Anthropocene, where where we can no longer um, control the the effects of, of, of our sort of economic growth and. Uh, um, our, uh, our plundering of the Earth's resources. And I think it's just simply a, a, a naive delusion to imagine that uh, we can solve all of these problems. Um, and, and, you know, the, the fact that this, this, this contagion, this current pandemic, seems to have emerged through some sort of accidental contagion between man and animal shows us how, how fragile our human existence is and, and how, uh, you know, um, how much we are dependent upon very unstable ecological networks. Um, so I think it's really brought home to many of us, um, you know, really how vulnerable our human societies are and, uh, and how, how, dependent, how dependent they are upon the natural environment. Well, if I am to mm. uh, voice a personal comment, mm. it, I think that the amount of stress related to the uh, pandemic internationally shows mm. also a very sudden realization that there is the possibility of death that will mm. not necessarily arrive when you are 85 years yes, old. Yes, that's right. And so this uh, dictated the urgency of certain politics yes. in a very efficient way and made any alternative, whichever that might be, of countering the pandemic again. Uh, unthinkable. So we are we are led to quite surreal choices mm. in uh, temporal point A, March, for example, 2020. Uh, a full lockdown is imperative. Yes. On temporal in temporal point B, for example, September and October 2020 in mm. Greece, mm. a lockdown is unthinkable because the economy yes. would not be able to survive after this, even though the facts on the ground are mm. not different or even worse. Mm, mm. So there is this randomness, yes. uh, which it seems to me is prompted by this uh, hysterical reaction to yes. a crisis that has to do with very deep roots, yes. with very deep roots, such yes. as this encounter with death yes, that seems to have been forgotten as a possibility by societies. Mm. Uh, this brings me to Agamben's comments during mm. the pandemic crisis with which you have engaged, etc. And uh, so, for example, there's a talk tomorrow, tomorrow as far as the date of the recording is concerned, of course, with which, in which you engage with that, if I'm not uh, in, in mistaken. In part, yes, in, in part. Yeah. Uh, could you please comment on that as well? And Gabin had made some comments yes. in a series of articles that were thought of as quite controversial. Mm. But what is your take? Well, uh, in the, the first interview that he gave um, was in the very early stages of the, of the contagion and the, and the lockdown. And uh, he s seemed to be making comments which were suggesting that um, you know, the, 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 the crisis was, was overblown, over-exaggerated, that the virus wasn't quite as, as, as harmful uh, um, as everyone thought it was. Uh, but in, in a subsequent interview he said well I'm not I'm not an expert I'm not an I'm not an epidemiologist I, um, I'm, you know, I'm not a, a, a medical officer I mean uh, I think he was making a, a kind of a, a broader comment really about the way in which governments use this as a kind of an, a, as an excuse or an opportunity to uh, uh, deploy unprecedented emergency powers and he was linking this to the idea of the state of exception um, the way in which you know sovereign power will always um, use crises as kind of an excuse to, to you know to, to expand their uh, regimes of control, 
And I think that's a perfectly valid point. I mean, it's something which I'm, I'm very worried about, so the way in which the, the state of emergency might become a permanent feature of everyday life. Um, and, and, and also, sorry, and also the way in which people will, will accept this, you know, without, without, without any, without much, much protest or much resistance. People will just accept, well, you know, we need to go back into our houses again and lock everything up and uh, lock ourselves up. Um, so, so, so I think, I think Ogamun was actually quite unfairly criticised. Um, you know, uh, he was talking about the way in which um, this fear of mortality, this fear of death, and this kind of this what do you call it, like a biopolitical imperative that you know you have to somehow preserve biological life at all costs. That you know that the preservation of, 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 of simple physical biological life is somehow the most important political element or the most important political objective leads to, he would say, a sacrifice of freedom, a sacrifice of the other things where, which actually make life worth living. important and worth living, exactly. Yeah. This was my uh, follow-up question yes. that uh, Agamben's main astonishment was mm. precisely with the preparedness of Italians in his yes, particular yes, case yes. to sacrifice a social, political, yes. love life. Yes. Everything that is communal, yeah, everything that is... Symbolic life, religious life, you know, in, in, yeah, absolutely, yes. Everything that is something else from mm. a body sitting in front of a computer mm. and somehow you mm. Know, mm. <laughs> being connected to the world, but mm. not in the physical way that we know, in yes. his comments on the university, etc. But how do you think that this prioritization came about? I assume that all three of us, you, Agamben, and myself, <laughs> agree that count effectively countering the pandemic is a valid objective. The question mm. is how this happened, mm. how the state amassed immense powers that will make it hungry for more or for retaining them, mm. one has yes. to assume, etc. Yeah. But how did this prioritization on the part of the people come about? Mm. Because it seems that uh, Agamben uh, thinks that this is a new thing, that this is something that emerged now with the crisis. This is not how historically uh, mm. peoples would think. Well, uh, Agamben would relate this to this question of biopolitics, the way in which, um, I suppose, from a certain point in, in Western history, um, I mean, Foucault would date this to the 18th century, for instance, or 17th to 18th century, that the life, biological life, somehow becomes the, the, the kind of the core objective of politics. Um, life is there to be exploited by the economy. Uh, life is there to uh, be mobilized by the state. Um, so it's to do with the, you know, the, um, I guess, the protection and the preservation of the health of the, of the population. Um, but unfortunately, this, this, this becomes increasingly a life which is stripped of any kind of symbolic value. It's simply this idea of, of being alive in a kind of a biological sense. Um, yeah, so, so, so biology becomes the kind of the central calculation of, of, of the politics of the state. Well, of course, and, for Agamben, it's... Uh, well, he, well, he takes it all back to the ancient Greeks, of course, and, and the Romans and so on. But I mean, yeah, it's 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 what it's what you call bio, you know, biopolitics, the sort of the uh, the biologicization of uh, of political life, and it's something which we've all bought into, right? I mean, we we all expect to live long and healthy lives. Um, you know, uh, we all expect our life to be sort of extended, uh, you know, beyond beyond the limits which were previously thought unthinkable by previous generations or in previous periods of history. Um, so. I would like your comment on a certain impasse that concerns particularly the left. Uh, anarchist politics would not expect something from the state in order right. for this to be a proper <coughs> question in that context. On the one hand, biopolitics is a foul word, an expletive mm -hmm. in, uh, in the left. Uh, obviously, it's always meant in a negative, uh, with yeah. a negative connotation. Mm. On the other hand, particularly during the pandemic, uh, many have uh, asked, for m m the, it was a, cert a central desideratum for the left that the state would care for public health, yes. that the state would be there for the health of the individual, mm. rather than uh, leaving that to the private sector and to the ones who have the means in mm. order to safeguard their own uh, health, etc. So we have here two antithetical positions. On the one hand, mm. I'm oversimplifying, of course, yeah. by saying the left, but still. Mm. Uh, the left 
sees something inherently evil in biopolitics. On the other hand, yeah. the left asks for the state to provide mm. uh, con uh, and to safeguard the health of the individual as a main... Uh, and actually this is a very central part of its mm. identity. So how about this in pace? How about this dead end? I mean, these are the two sides of the biopolitical question, really. I mean, on the one hand, control. On the other hand, public health. Yes. Um, and I think, in a way, you can't really have one without the other. I, I mean, um, I mean, on the one hand, I think it's it's very it's very it's a good thing, and it's very important that, that the state is is attempting to 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 protect public health rather than simply relying upon the private sector. And, and pouring in far, vast sums of money. Um, uh, on the other hand, we, all, we, we always need to be conscious, I think, of the, um, uh, of the, you know, the, um, the consequences of that in terms of the extension of state control over, over everyday life. Perhaps you can't really have one without the other. I'm not sure. And we saw during the pandemic how mm. on steroids this can... Uh, yes, yes. Uh, this can turn out, yes. yes. Might I ask you about your perhaps main expertise, post-anarchism, the dreaded question that any expert uh, fears <laughs> is what is your expertise? Explain to us what post-anarchism is. Right. But I'm terribly sorry for posing this question yes, to yes, you yes. because our viewers might, might not be familiar with the notion. Of course. And what puts the post in post-anarchism? Well, okay, uh, so uh, I mean anarchism as a, is a kind of an anti-authoritarian ethics and, and politics and philosophy which which has a, a long history going back to the 18th 19th century we think about major thinkers like uh, Mikhail Bakunin and uh, Peter Kropotkin the, the Russian anarchist uh, uh, Pierre Joseph Proudhon uh, my um, theory of post anarchism is an attempt to update anarchist philosophy to make it more relevant to the 21st century post really implies post structuralism rather mm. than um, uh, rather than somehow suggesting anarchism has been superseded. So um, it's really an attempt to kind of think about what anarchism and what radical politics might mean um, in the period of, of, of post-modernity or late modernity, whether, for instance, the concept of the revolution with a capital R still, still has any meaning. What, is, what, does it actually, what does revolution mean today? Um, I mean, for Bakunin, it meant smashing the state. Um, you know, for, for Marx it meant the working class taking over the state or, the, you know, or the, for Lenin it meant the vanguard party taking over the state. Does the state still exist as a kind of a centralised political structure in the same way in which it did, you know, back in the, in the uh, 19th and early parts of the 20th century, for instance? I don't think so. I think, I think power today is much more invisible. It's much more networked. So we, we need to perhaps rethink what the idea of revolution means. Um, anarchism also had a, 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 a particular view of human nature. Human nature was seen to be benign, uh, naturally cooperative, naturally sociable. Are those assumptions still true? Were they ever true? I'm not quite so sure. Um, so post-anarchism is really an attempt to kind of rethink some of the central aspects of anarchist theory um, through the lens of thinkers like Foucault and uh, Derrida and uh, Deleuze and uh, Lacanian psychoanalysis, for instance, um, and to try to, in a way, make it more relevant to contemporary struggles, which, which tend to be, in a way, more localised, more around specific issues, no longer based upon uh, the proletariat or the working class, as in the sort of the classical revolutionary discourse. Um, and so we find a whole series of struggles, don't we, around, around the environment, around, um, I don't know, around, around identity, around, um, and, and struggles which take place at a more localised, perhaps community-based level, contesting particular relations of power or particular relations of, of domination, uh, rather than thinking about politics as a kind of a, a grand, totalising, revolutionary event. Um, so perhaps there's a rather convoluted definition of, of post-anarchism, which I've just given you, but... Um, <laughs> I would very much like to ask you about the particular forms that uh, radical politics would take in a post-anarchist um, uh, setting, in a post-anarchist context. I, I mean, for me, the main um, element here is the idea of autonomy, the, the, uh, the project of creating autonomous communities 
in the present moment, rather than waiting for the grand apocalyptic revolutionary event. Um, I mean, and in a way, anarchists have often stressed the, the importance of localized experiments, you know, whether they're in you know, squats or communes or, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the forms of the, the social centers you have in, in Zotro, in, in, in Exarchia, for instance, you know, yes. like, like Nazotros. Uh, all of these are kinds of experiments in autonomous anarchist politics where, where, the, where the project is to develop alternative relations between participants. Um, and um, so, so the notion of what's called prefiguration is quite important. And prefiguration is the idea that um, that you you try to, in a way, create an alternative society within the present moment, uh, and and you you don't try to em employ authoritarian means to change society because if you do that, then you simply replicate the structures which you have now in, into the future. Um, so yeah, I, th I think it's about experimentation and creating alternative relationships in, in the present moment. Um, the, the famous uh, anarchist Gustav Landauer said that the state is, we, I mean, we imagine the state is this kind of top-down centralized structure which kind of oppresses us, but what he says said is, is that the state is a series of interpersonal relationships between individuals. That's all the state is. And that you as it were, destroy the state through changing relationships between people. And, and, and to me, that's really the, the kind of the central ethical focus of post-anarchism as a, as, a, as a form of politics. When anarchism was uh, formulated, the main powers, the, the largest power structures were uh, states. Mm. However, now, Private individuals, so persons, have amassed such wealth yes, yes, yes. or such abilities via, for example, owning Facebook yes, right. that uh, these can be confidently said to be more powerful, yes. more defining of people's lives yes. than the state, if potentially or uh, actively. Mm. So how does uh, post-anarchism respond to this uh, very practical, radical change mm. in reality? Mm. I, I think this is one of the the problem is actually radical politics that there's no longer really uh, an objective target to overthrow or to destroy. Um, you know, that the power power becomes largely invisible. I mean, our, as you say, our real masters today are uh, those who own the, um, you know, the, 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 the big tech companies, for instance. You know, there's the Googles and Facebooks and... Companies the, bigger than states. Uh, absolutely, <laughs> and richer than states. That, that's right. So, um, I mean, there are real masters, and it's not the Donald Trumps of the world. I mean, this is just a, a kind of a, a, a spectacle of power, isn't it? I mean, real power is behind the scenes, and it really depends on, on who controls information, who controls the flows of, of, of data. And I, I think that that's, that's, a, that's a very difficult thing to, to resist or to fight against, because it depends upon our voluntary servitude, as it were, our, our, our voluntary participation on these kinds of digital platforms. Every time we go onto Facebook, we're making money for, for Mark Zuckerberg. You know, and, and we become the marketing product, of course, of these, uh, of these, um, of the, of these companies. So the question it's, is, who controls the, the means of the production of information, mm. in a certain sense, mm. in this context? Yes, in order to use this as a bridge to the question of political theology, right. one of your other mm -hmm. expertises, mm. Uh, when the when anarchism, for example, was first formulated, was uh, at a period in time yes. where religions were still strong, although contested, mm. and more or less identified or in conjunction with state power. Uh, for example, well, the ancien regime would be the most obvious example, but still, uh, it was an enemy to be uh, defeated. Now, yes. however, we see in some in certain contexts that it might be religious communities mm. that will articulate radical yes. uh, politics, yes. uh, left-wing politics, emancipatory politics, mm. against a secular consensus that would do precisely the opposite. Mm. So how does this change as well? How, for example, a post-anarchist uh, discourse would engage with particular forms of religion, not mm. religion as an abstract phenomenon which might sure. or might not exist? No, I, th I think you're right. Um, uh, I mean, this is one of the features of, of, of secularization. Um, you know, the fact that uh, you know religion has obviously become 
I mean, it's, it's no longer associ as, as, associ as, as associated as it was with the state. I mean, Bakunin wrote a great essay called God and the State, and he said that the, the political sovereign is uh, simply a reflection of, of, the, um, of, of God, right? The, you know, the God and the state kind of mirror each other. And, and he believed that, you know, uh, the, the church and the state were, were two institutions which needed to be destroyed in the revolution. Yeah. And he, he hated religion and theology so much that he, he invoked Satan, the image of Satan and Satanism, as a kind of somehow this sort of symbol of liberation and freedom against the authority of the church. Um, now that the, there's a kind of a more of a, as it were, a separation between church and state and between religion and politics, um, I think it's possible, as you say, that, that you know, religious groups and religious communities can actually play a more of a, a, an emancipatory role in, in contemporary society. And, um, you know, that there's certain radical forms of, of public theology, for instance, you know, liberation theology, which we were talking about before, would be a good example of this, where, um, you, know, you know, religious communities and church groups will... Um, take up, you know, radical causes, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, sort of ecological struggles, for instance, or struggles for human rights, uh, struggles against various forms of violence and, and state oppression. Religious groups have played a prominent role in, in, in many forms of protest. For instance, in the Extinction Rebellion, which is yes. a very interesting movement, you, you often find church groups participating. There, is, an, there is even a branch, Christian Action for Extinction yes, Rebellion. Yes, exactly. Yes, that's right. That's right. With Rowan Williams speaking. Yes, that. yes. No, absolutely. That's right. <laughs> yes. There have been quite, quite a number of prominent the, you know, theologians I mean, who have been writing about this really since the 1960s and 1970s. People like you know, the Protestant theologian Jürgen Moltmann is a yes. very interesting example of this. Uh, um, and of course, there's also a tradition of what's called Christian anarchism, uh, which is quite interesting. So, so Christian anarchists will, um, uh, you know, take the most sort of radical interpretation of, of the scriptures, and particularly the, the Sermon on the Mount, which was all about, yes. you know, in a way equality and, um, uh, in a way, resisting the state through the development of alternative communities which are outside of the state. You know the whole notion of you know render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, yes. but but then at the same time, alongside of the state, do your own thing. You know, develop these kinds of you know sort of alternative um, you know religious communities, for instance, which um, you know which employ you know radically egalitarian and, and sort of uh, you know decentralized forms of uh, forms of association. So the whole topic of religion is more nuanced today, one could yeah, say, so. than yes. it was when yes. Yes. the first scriptures yes. of uh, anarchism or other currents were formulated, yes. articulated. Yes. Yes. So uh, what is political theology? Well, that's a, that's a complicated question, of course. I mean, and there's many different definitions of political. There's as many definitions of political theology as there are people writing about it. Um, I, I have written a book on political theology, as you know, and it, it uh, starts with, with Carl Schmitt's Understanding, which is to say that um, that uh, modern institutions like the sovereign state are kind of a, like a based upon a secularization of theological concepts such as God and the miracle, right? So what he argued was that um, you know with the uh, the collapse of the theological world in the 16th century, that um, that that uh, theological concepts have become integrated into, into and, and indeed form the basis of, of political concepts, right? The trouble with Schmidt, of course, is that, uh, you, know, uh, I mean, you know, you know, his, his career trajectory, he later, you know, sort of, sort of you know, joined the Nazis and became... The, it wasn't the, very fortunate. No, no, exactly. <laughs> Not very fortunate. But, but even, 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 uh, even prior to that, in, in 1922, when he wrote his book, Political Theology, he was really trying to justify kind of a authoritarian, kind of Hobbesian state which which would be able to exercise emergency powers like like we're seeing today of course in the in the uh in the uh in, in the response to to the coronavirus um so so my understanding of political theology is the idea that um that we have to we have to you can't really have a kind of a, a, a coherent understanding of political institutions without without an exploration of their foundation in theology and it's also the way in which modern forms of power try to, as it were, fill the void or fill the gap left by, left by the collapse of, of theology. So in a word, secularization has created, if you like, a kind of a gap or a void in our symbolic universe, which was once occupied by God. God's now out of the picture. 
um, and different forms of power try to fill the space. And this can be the power of the state, it can be the power of technology, it can be, it can be the economy, for instance, as a kind of a, uh, a godlike entity. Uh, and that, in a way, radical politics has to, um, has to find ways of um, countering this imperative to always fill the, fill the space. Now, I think subsequently I've, I've um, changed my understanding of political theology to actually in, in, encompass or incorporate more radical forms of, of, of theology as we were talking about just a moment ago. So I don't think political theology has to be this kind of conservative, uh, um, monotheistic idea based upon Schmitt's theory. I think that's just one particular understanding of political theology. I'm, I'm also interested in the way in which, you know, um, uh, theology can actually take on a more sort of radical position and support, you know, struggles for ecology and human rights and uh, anti-violence yes. struggles and so on. Two so, questions on that, if I may, mm. uh, an academic one and a, and a more theoretical one. Mm. The academic one is uh, currently political theology has immense purchase in academia for some reason. It has its moment. It, yes, it yes, its I moment. think so. Yes. Why? That's right. And the second question, yes. which is interrelated. So we witness a number of uh, radical philosophers, intellectuals mm. that profess atheism engaging politically with uh, the Christian legacy mm. in uh, anticipation that they will find material of interest therein. From Badiou to Zizek yes. to Agamben, there is a whole array of thinkers yes. that yes. profess to be atheists, but yes. are political theologians yeah, themselves. Sure, sure. sure. Yeah. So, what's going on? What's going on? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, there's, there's what, what we can call uh, Christian atheism, if you like. Yes. Um, uh, and that, this sort of goes back to, to, to the death of God theology. So people like, uh, like Altizer um, uh, suggested, and, and also people like Gianni, Gianni Vattimo, I don't know if you're the Italian philosopher, yes. um, argued that, if you like, the, um, the ultimate conclusion of Christianity is the, is the death of God in a way that in a Christianity or the, the destiny of Christianity is secularism. That God, in a way, um, abstracts himself from the world. And this is the way it should be. This is what Christianity is actually all about. It, it, it ends up in a kind of a, a secular pluralistic society, which is, you know, compatible with, with, with you know, with, with difference and uh, um, uh, different kinds of identities. And, and so, you know, the true message of Christianity is not about, um, you know, imposing some kind of moralistic vision upon society. On the contrary, the, the, the true message of Christianity is about sort of, you know, love and tolerance. And um, now contemporary philosophers like, um, you know, Badiou and Zizek, I think are quite interested in employing the, the kind of the radical message of, of Christianity, particularly its universalism. You know, its idea that, you know, it's, it's not about... Um, uh, it's, it's not about, you know, sort of nations or, or classes. It's this kind of genuinely sort of, you know, universalistic message of, you know, of, of, you know love and, and, and solidarity. And they, they would see that there's something, um, there's something compatible there with, with, you know, with sort of communism and... Uh, well, but use of that yes, uh, yes, vein. Yes, yes, that's right. Curiously, uh, what you described before is mm. more Zizek's predicament, apart mm. from uh, Zizek is all about this. Uh, and what about academia? Why does it have such a purchase in academia? Look, I, I, think, I, I, I think it's it's the recognition that we live in a kind of a post-secular age. Um, I mean, the, 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 uh, the promise of secularism was, that, you know, that the religion would be consigned to the private space, be a matter of private belief. It wouldn't really enter into politics but what we've seen of course you know in recent decades is the the return of religion um, you know whether it's Islamic fundamentalism whether it's you know Christian evangelism or whether it's uh, you know many other forms of religion you know, religion has become much more of a feature of of the public space you know, um, you know religious groups are kind of you know demanding recognition they're demanding you know the you know different sort of legal systems for instance um, they are not going anywhere. As no, they're not going anywhere. No. Sociologists in the sixties no. would have it. Uh, absolutely, that's right. <laughs> yes. That's right. So, so I think I think you know the the interest in political theology is an attempt to understand why religion has, well, what, why why it's, why why it now seems to be more visible and more prominent in the in in the in the public space. Why it's more influential. Why there's more and more religiously inspired 
groups why uh, you know religious pronunciation uh, pronouncements um, uh, increasingly inflect political discourse, for instance. Um, and and so so I think the you know it, the interest in political theology is really an attempt to kind of understand the roots of of this kind of current post secular condition. I mean, Jürgen Habermas, for instance, wrote an interesting essay some years ago called "Post Secular." The post secular society, and he said, you know, that um, we need to find ways of uh, accommodating religious difference. You, you can't have a strictly secularist model, um, and, and you also have to recognise that, you know, um, people who have strong religious views still have a right to engage in politics, and, and we shouldn't simply ignore these people, or push them aside because of their their religious opinions. Yet again, for example, there are two ways of understanding post-secularism. Mm. Mm. Uh, Habermas has a more uh, soft approach, yes. as in post-secularism, what happens after secularism is the case. Mm. While other definitions of post-secularism speak about a desecularization, Peter Berger, the, the prophet of the secularization right. thesis, right. as right. you know, but I'm saying that for the viewer, <laughs> yeah. you'd be familiar. Um, he spoke about the desecularization of the world even in the 90s, mm. as soon as the 90s, etc. Mm, mm. So there is a more hardline p uh, definition of uh, post secular, uh, as in the secularization thesis is dead, we yes. have all killed him, yes. he killed it, yes, yes. etc. And now a post secular era emerges, whatever that might mean, uh, whoever, whoever would have the um, sovereignty there, as far as numbers are, con are concerned, like uh, mm. <coughs> Islam, etc. Uh, but mm. and there is also a political theology aspect in the coronavirus crisis, a very mm. central one. Mm. How uh, there is a secular metaphysics in it's all it, this, in the, the encounter with death, etc. The, the apocalypse. Yes, 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 yes. And the, the power the, 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 the state as Messiah. Yes. The state as Messiah or as a failed Messiah. Yeah, as a failed Messiah, I would say. I'm not, I'm not yes. sure how the salvation, um, our salvation lies in the state. No, I, I think you're right. I mean, I think, um, I think it's, it's very tempting in a way to uh, understand this in kind of theological terms as some kind of divine punishment, um, uh, whether it's, you know, whether it's God or whether it's Gaia, for instance, you know, the, the God of the earth. Yes, um, the being, heathens. That's right. <laughs> Maybe we're being punished for our, uh, our, our hubris and our, uh, our arrogance and being reminded, uh, I think in a very important way, being reminded of, of, our, of, of human finitude, human limits, human mortality. Please. No, I, I was going to say, I mean, I, I, think, I think the narrative of the apocalypse and, and the end of time and the end of days is, is very, um, very present right now, actually. Yes. Uh, we hope that the world would not indeed end. No. Uh, may I ask you for your concluding thoughts on uh, radical uh, politics, the climate crisis, right. and the internet and sovereignty and authority and power and emancipation? Well, the last question was a bit convoluted, <laughs> yeah. but you know, the relationship There's lots of, questions of the internet and the di di digitalization of everything right. with the question of power and emancipation. Right. Um, uh, well, Gosh, I mean, Sorry. no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, 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 um, no, I mean, the, the okay, so, so we're seeing many, Summing up, you know, we, we, we're seeing many um, conflicting and, and contradictory developments. We're seeing the accumulation of, of political power, I think, in, in the hands of the sovereign state. Uh, we're also seeing the accumulation of power in, in um, by digital platforms like, like Zoom, for instance. Apparently, Zoom profits have gone up by 300%. In recent times, you know, so the the, the market capitalization of, of these kinds of um, companies, I think, is, is sort of testament to the way in which our lives have become increasingly virtualized, and 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 this, you know, this kind of virtual existence has just become totally accelerated now in in, in the past few months, right? I mean, people are just, you know, you know, the way in which people are working from home and sort of holding endless and often pointless uh, meetings and 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 conferences on. Um, uh, on Zoom, and I, I think I think it's a very worrying development. Um, on the other hand, as I was saying before, I mean, one of the things which really gives me hope is the way in which people are still prepared to engage in in politics of protest and, and resistance and civil disobedience, despite all of these um, 
these measures, and it's almost it's almost like it's almost like a kind of a reaction against the virtualization of life, isn't it? Against a certain direction in the yes. virtualization of yes. life, because an emancipatory potential could be found therein as well, and they understand. Uh, I it. think so. Yes, and as they're not anti-technological. No, 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 no. That's true. Yes. That's true. And I, I think I think they obviously employed both. Um, you know, and and the the digital technology is very important as a tool, as I said, of, of communication and mobilization and so on. But it, it it can't replace mass gatherings, I don't think, of various kinds. And uh, a concluding comment on uh, politics and climate change. Well, that's this is the, you know, this is the looming political question. This is the the, the political horizon of our times, isn't it? I mean, the elephant in the room. As they the, say. Well, yes. indeed, yeah. Um, you know, and I think I think this the current emergency has really just given us a little glimpse of, of what life can be like and how life can be disrupted by by you know major ecological catastrophes. Um, you know, you have, you have wildfires burning in the Arctic. Uh, I mean, it's it's. I mean, the water's just being <laughs> being destroyed around the rise. And I yeah. think I think we're really at a kind of a tipping point, ecologically speaking. Um, so so it, it seems to me that if there is some kind of collective vision possible today. And it's hard to define one, but but if there is, it has to be around struggles around around ecology and around around you know climate change and resisting climate change in, 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 as as much as we can, you know. And, and this would be you know obviously involved moves towards you know decarbonisation and, and and but also going beyond this, I mean in a way radically changing the way in which we in which we live. Well, there are competing proposals of Green New Deals, yes. in the plural, yes. but they still uh, have failed to occupy central stage in politics yes. because there is still the sentiment that all this is secondary, it's not in, the mm. danger is not imminent, or for some conspiracy theories it's not real, etc. Yes, yes, yes. But solutions have been proposed, a number of them, alternative solutions, but it seems that uh, the, 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 the the mm. public, mm. shepherded by power, is not ready as no. of yet for no. that. Let's see. Professor Saul Newman, thank you very much you're, for this discussion. You're, you're quite welcome. It was yes. immensely illuminating. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for watching the discussion and see you soon, hopefully. Yeah.